what is your take and reaction to what Israel is doing here? Because it seems like this these months that we've been talking about a uh, proliferation of a regional conflict appear to be building up toward exactly that. Well, I think what's clear here is neither Israel nor Hezbollah want a regional conflict. Um, you know, this is uh, what Israel is doing is, uh, again, horrific for the civilians that are being killed. Uh, it's the largest uh, bombing that they've done, but it's very measured um, and somewhat restrained. Um, you know, they are bar bombing certain targets and they're avoiding other targets, uh, targets that would, uh, you know, compel Hezbollah to escalate further. Notice that when Hezbollah did fire on Tel Aviv with a rocket the first time, um, it was just one <laughs> and it got shot down by an arrow three. Uh, so it didn't hit the Mossad headquarters. Uh, they claim it was aimed at the Mossad headquarters. We don't know, but it was a demonstration of capability, uh, an escalation, but limited escalation, sort of a warning shot uh, to Israel. Um, and we see Israel sending back signal, uh, you know, back channel signals that they want they they want to negotiate it into, you know, this current phase uh, because it was never intended to become a regional war, and they don't want it to become a regional war. It was always meant to be a pressure valve for. Uh, domestic uh, political pressures being put on Netanyahu, even the triggering of the uh, the decision to use the pagers, um, you know, as a to weaponize the pagers, you know, you don't spend, you know, according to you know, I think the New York Times or, or, or uh, you know somebody who reported a uh, 15 years, uh, you know, doing everything it takes to create the capacity to manufacture these devices uh, to gain the confidence of the consumer market. Remember, you're coming in into a market that's already saturated. You have to gain the confidence and in the process, uh, convince uh, Hezbollah procurement agents that you're a trustworthy source. Um, you know, so that's a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resources uh, to create a potential. And the potential is to uh, inject chaos and uncertainty amongst uh, Hezbollah at a critical time. Now, the ideal place to do this would have been right as Israel is attacking or right before. I mean, I'm talking about an hour before. You want the pager still going off as the bombs are falling. You want the, there to be no gap between, you know, operation blow up the pager to operation we're, take, we're pushing Hezbollah north of the Latani River. Um, that didn't happen. Pagers went off got headlines a couple of days, and then Israel begins a limited operation, no ground incursion, nothing, just air, air assaults. Um, this tells you this is all about politics. This is about Netanyahu doing things to achieve a domestic political um, objective, which is his continued political survival. And so we, 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 we have to couch everything in, in those terms. Israel's not trying to defeat Hezbollah right now. Uh, Netanyahu saying all the right things, made his little videotape message and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, he, first of all, he knows that he can't attain his number one objective was to get 60,000 people returned to their homes in northern Israel. How do you do that? Well, you got to defeat Hezbollah. He's not going to defeat Hezbollah. This isn't a defeat Hezbollah campaign. Uh, this is save my skin in Israel campaign to create the notion, the impression that I'm doing something. Um, to get the pressure off of me for not doing anything, especially about ceasefire and returning of the hostages. The pager thing garnered a lot of headlines, a lot of support. It'll be forgotten. I mean, it'll, in terms of its impact on the, uh, on the conflict, it's, it's already forgotten. There's a couple of people saying, oh my God, that was her. But more people died in the bombings than died in the pager attack uh, by a huge number, order of magnitude. Um, so I, I think people are already from the military and, and, and shocks, they're over the pager attack. It's done. It's finished. Uh, the new thing now is the uh, the barcodes that Israel's flooded with leaflets that uh, you know get people to turn it on. Then they suck your phone out and then they <coughs> target you. Um, you know. But again, think of what the Israelis just did there. You got to forgive my voice. <coughs> I just came off a podcast prior to this, speaking straight for an hour. So, <coughs> so I'll slow it down and calm down my voice. Um, think, again, the barcode operation. In order to do that, you have to have a barcode 
that creates connectivity to an Israeli intelligence collection platform. <clears throat> the barcode has to be linked to hacking tools that are very sensitive hacking tools. Um, anybody who's been involved in cyber warfare or, or things of that nature, just look, do you remember Vault 7, um, the WikiLeaks um, thing of, of the CIA hacking tools and how, excuse my language, pissed off the United States became when Vault 7 tools were, were put out there? Um, right. Because these are unique tools. These, these, these are tools that aren't, nobody's supposed to know about. They're supposed to give us an advantage in this cyber warfare hacking world. They were leaked. The Israeli tools here are very sensitive, uh, developed for, for you know, a specific thing. And what they're doing is flooding the market with QR codes. I can guarantee you that the Iranians, um, the Russians, everybody has gotten this barcode and they brought their NSA guys in and they let this thing play out. And they have reverse engineered the hacking tools. And now Israel, this is one time deal. All that skill set that Israel brought to bear on this problem is gone. Gone. For what? For what? Um, politics. I mean, Israel is, is, is thrown away, um, you know, now three intelligence operations. The pagers, the, um, the, the, the walkie-talkies, and now the, the barcodes uh, that were years in the making. Um, a lot of time and effort were put into it. And these were designed to achieve a certain result. And for cheap political, you know, purposes, these very expensive uh, intelligence-driven resources are, are, are being lost. Um, it just shows the desperation of, uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu right now. Hezbollah, you know, everybody, all the headlines, Israel bombs Lebanon, Israel bombs Lebanon, Israel bombs Lebanon. Guys, you're missing something here. Hezbollah keeps sending rockets into Israel, and they're not, the Iron Dome isn't shooting them down. They're pounding the crap out of places that haven't been pounded before, causing thousands of more Israelis to flee. So Netanyahu's political objective of returning the 60,000 has become a political nightmare because it's now going to become returning the 80,000 or returning the 100,000, uh, which he's not going to do until there's a ceasefire in Gaza, which is a decision he's trying to avoid. I think what he's doing with Lebanon is creating the potential of a crisis, uh, the consequences of which far exceed the consequences of him agreeing to a ceasefire so that he can make some sort of domestic political exchange saying, I'm avoiding this conflict based upon posturing of strength. And in return, you know, we have to swallow this poison pill. Uh, he's trying to get that sort of calculus in place because right now, as things stands, if he accepts a ceasefire in Gaza, he's finished politically. Um, you know, even if he gets the hostages back, he's not going to survive the, you know, once, once the Israeli population starts looking at October 7th and, and his response to that, uh, it's tough to recover from that unless he can create some other issue, uh, that, uh, that, uh, because of the scope and scale of the consequences of allowing this to spin out of control, it, um, it offsets the political damage done through the so that's his calculation. I don't think he succeeds. I think no matter what, he will have he will be compelled to accept a ceasefire, and his government will collapse, and that's the end of Netanyahu. But he's going to drag this thing out as long as possible, and that's what's going on in southern Lebanon. This is all about Benjamin Netanyahu. It's not about anything else. Well, it's interesting, Scott, as we have even Israeli media reports talking about exactly what you're saying, and I'm curious about your thoughts about uh, you know, this uh, publication, Israel Hoyam, they published uh, from uh, well, it, 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 Israeli Reserves General Gershon Ho Cohen, who said that not only is Israel operating with no strategy against Hezbollah, but that Hezbollah is undefeated here and has the potential to drain Israel essentially into the abyss. And uh, uh, what we're seeing, he says, is that those exact two objectives that were plainly stated by Netanyahu and the Israeli regime, which was to return the settlers and to deter Hezbollah, have not only have not occurred, but nothing that Israel is doing is going to make that occur. So uh, 
there was so much, I feel like, immediate reaction and emotional response from people watching this thinking, well, wow, Israel really just did a major blow to Hezbollah and to the axis of resistance. What do you have to say to that? Because it seems like even Israeli media is saying, no, that's not the case at all. Let's go back to the, the predicate here. Um, first of all, Hezbollah is undefeated when it comes to Israel. Um, Israel hasn't beaten them. Hezbollah's beat, beaten Israel. Hezbollah drove Israel out of southern Lebanon. Um, and Hezbollah fought the Israelis to a standstill in 2006, compelling Israel to back away from uh, the political objectives that they had set. And since then, Hezbollah's had a, um, a, a relative parity of deterrence, meaning that there's been back and forth, but uh, Israel has never again dared to undertake the kind of massive operation in that it did in 2006 because Hezbollah has been preparing a retaliation that exceeds um, the, its response in 2006. So, you know, for basically 18 years, Hezbollah has been preparing for this very eventuality. There's nothing about the Israeli military capabilities that Hezbollah is unfamiliar with. They're not stupid. They know what an F-35 can do. They know what ordnance the F-35 can drop. They know what the F-16 drops. They know, um, you know, Israel's targeting processes. They know what sensors Israel uses to collect information. And for 18 years, Hezbollah has been building a defensive system designed to not only survive, but function against everything Israel has. So we're, we're all sitting here watching bombs blow up in Lebanon. Go, oh man, Israel's knocking the crap out of Hezbollah. Hezbollah has been preparing for this forever. But that doesn't mean that you know, they didn't collapse a bunker here, that they didn't strike a building with people here. It's war. People are going to die. Israel will get in a couple shots. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it's also, you know, we, we talk about Hezbollah's capabilities, and they're impressive. You know, but anybody who thinks, well, Hezbollah can, can do this at will. Well, I Israel has defenses. They're not perfect, but they have defenses. Hezbollah shot a rocket against Tel Aviv. You know, an advanced rocket, not a hypersonic rocket, but an advanced rocket. And it got shot down by the Arrow 3. Why? Because Israel's been preparing for this too. Both sides have been preparing for this conflict. Um, but the notion that Hezbollah is going to be defeated by Israel in a week is just stupid. Hezbollah's been preparing, preparing for this for 18 years. They, you know, Hamas, everybody's amazed by the Hamas tunnel network. Well, you know who does tunnels better than Hamas? Hezbollah. First of all, the terrain is more conducive to it. I mean, they are deep underground. They are protected by rocks. Um, you, you know, you're, you're dropping bombs on mountainsides, on hillsides. You, you might get a little shake here and there, but you're not you're not doing anything. And, and Hezbollah has everything underground. And there's redundancy. Hezbollah's not dumb enough to say, we're going to put all our eggs in this one basket. You know, because when that basket goes boom, you got no more eggs. They've spread it out so that they can take losses here, losses there, but they can back it up here and continue the fight. And Hezbollah is prepared to take this fight as far as they want. But there's a hesitancy here because Hezbollah is the Lebanese government. That's another thing people tend to forget. You know, Hezbollah is a terrorist organization and a political party, too. One that's participated in democratic processes in Lebanon and done quite well. One that has, plays a significant role in the Lebanese government uh, and has done well by Lebanon, meaning that there hasn't been selfish only about Hezbollah. They've done the right thing for Lebanon, for the Lebanese people. And Nasrallah, when he speaks, speaks about his duty and responsibilities, not just to the Shia, the southern uh, Lebanese Shia who make up the majority of Hezbollah, but to Lebanon as a whole. He understands his responsibility. So he's not going to do anything precipitous that's going to cause the people of Lebanon to get hammered. And the way he's behaved here, look, you have Christians, Sunni Muslims, Druze, all saying, uh, rival Shia parties, all saying they're with Hezbollah in this fight. The Lebanese government, their army is with Hezbollah because they recognize that Nasrallah has done nothing wrong here, that he's done everything right, that he's managed this escalation. He's not been irresponsible. It's Israel's gross overreaction, which is what Hezbollah is banking on because it's the same thing with Hamas carrying out October 7th gambling this is a good gamble, by the way, that Israel is going to overreact and, and, and then generate cause and effect relationships that are detrimental uh, almost exclusively to Israel. 
Hezbollah is doing the same thing. Um, one of the great weaknesses that Hezbollah had is that in pursuing the potential conflict with Israel, uh, Israel would be able to use that conflict to drive a wedge between Hezbollah and the Lebanese people. Uh, the, you know, the Lebanese in August 2006, um, they weren't happy about being indiscriminately targeted by Israel. And they, many of them blamed Hezbollah for this. And Hezbollah took that lesson to heart and said, in the future, we can't have a situation where we don't consider the people of Lebanon that we act based upon our unilateral wants and desires against Israel and the consequences be damned. No, no. Every bomb that Israel drops on Lebanon right now that kills Lebanese civilians further alienates the people of Lebanon um, from Israel and unites them with Hezbollah. This is a, I think this is a, a consequence that the Israeli government didn't foresee. Hmm. And then lastly on this uh, topic, Scott, uh, what do you have to say about the reports during this bombardment of Lebanon that Hezbollah asked Iran to attack Israel or to maybe facilitate its response, its retaliation to Israel and Iran? is reportedly, and again, these are all Israeli and U.S. officials saying this, so we take it with a grain of salt, but uh, supposedly Iran told Hezbollah the timing isn't right. Now, th I want to ask you this in the context, about this in the context of uh, those who constantly, whether it's comments, questions I get, say, wow, uh, uh, Iran, Hezbollah, the ISIS of resistance are looking uh, weaker here. They're looking like they are in, not in the driver's seat, but actually being uh, repelled back and potentially defeated. I've had some people close to me uh, lament about this. Scott, what do you have to say about this in the context of these reports? First of all, I, I, I strongly doubt that. Again, let's just go back to basics. First of all, Hezbollah doesn't operate in a vacuum. <laughs> so um, Iran and Hezbollah have coordinated uh, what coordinated this scenario uh, for, again, 18 years. Um, Hezbollah's defenses, which are designed to absorb far more punishment than Israel is delivering, um, were designed, you know, with the Iranians assisting, knowledgeable of, um, you know, advising on. And these are defenses that are linked to political objectives. Um, again, to, to buy into this notion, you'd have to accept two things. Uh, one, that uh, Nasrallah had given up on Lebanon, which he's not going to do. You know, because to say, oh, we need Iran to attack now implies general war and, and all that that entails. And two, that um, Hezbollah had given up on um, Hamas. Because an all-out war involving Iran and Israel creates a whole different problem set that the world, uh, the world is incapable of, you know, chewing gum and walking at the same time. Right now, the world's chewing on the gum of Hamas, uh, and it's 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 tough. They're having trouble doing that. But for the first time in a long time, people are talking about the creation of a Palestinian state. There's there's moving that direction. Israel's lost the moral authority around the world. Um, you know, these are these are things that realities that didn't exist on October 6th that exist today that are to the strategic detriment of, of Israel. And it's all because of the resistance of Hamas. But you get a general war with Iran and, and, and Hezbollah and regional disruption of energy security. Um, and suddenly people have high prices, collapsed economies, and nobody's going to give a damn about Hamas anymore or Gaza or the Palestinians. They have bigger issues, bigger issues. Um, and Iran and Hezbollah know this. They didn't do all what they've done to get Israel in this bad position just to throw it all away by saying, screw it, let's have the big war. So I don't believe that Hezbollah reached out to Iran. First of all, they wouldn't need to reach out to Iran because Iran and Hezbollah are, have coordinated this. You know, we, it, it, it's, it's, it's like, you know, I don't know. I, I was going to use an analogy nobody will understand, so I won't use it. But uh, it worked for me. <laughs> but uh, you know, I was like, that's a good one, but nobody will get it. Um, but the, the point is, you know, they, they've already coordinated all this. There's no there's no need for, you know, Hezbollah to, to call an audible at this stage. Um, there's nothing that's happened that's unexpected. It's all anticipated. All So that's absurd. I think this was inserted to generate the kind of discussions that you're seeing. Um, 
because Israel knows that it's lost the you know PR campaign so far, and so what they need to do is um, is is create some sort of um, you know, information warfare based pressure on on Hezbollah. But again, Hezbollah is not amateurs at this. Uh, I, I guess they were hoping to get the Lebanese people to lose faith and confidence in Hezbollah to generate to create discussions amongst them about the consequences of uh, a, a, you know a broader war. Um, but again, I as I said, I, I've been to Iran and I was deeply impressed with the intelligence of the Iranian people. I haven't been to Lebanon. I landed in Beirut airport once, but that was a different story altogether. Didn't want to be there, plane diverted. And I was an active duty Marine Corps officer in an in a, in a airport controlled by Hezbollah. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't want this. <laughs> Fortunately, I stayed on the plane. They left me alone and we got out of there. Um, but <laughs> that was a different story. But the, um, you know, the, the, they want to create, I think by doing this, they're trying to indirectly create pressure amongst the Lebanese population and the Arab population as a whole uh, that questions, um, you know, Hezbollah's status. They're trying to undermine that. Hezbollah's going to ride this thing out. As I said, and as you noted, uh, you know, they haven't stopped the Hezbollah shelling of uh, northern Israel. It's expanded. They're striking uh, Haifa. They can, they can expand it to Tel Aviv if that's the game that Israel wants to play. And you see the Israelis already starting to panic and looking for an off-ramp off of this because, you know, they, they didn't achieve what they thought they were going to achieve with uh, with Hezbollah. Uh, the Iranians are very mature. Hezbollah is very mature. Um, the Iranians know what they want. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.